Eh, Roberto, perdona, ¿habría que incorporar ya a todos los asistentes? Eh, voy, a, voy a esperar a que, a que me confirmen que... Están entrando. Vale, pero ya, ya he dado al botón. Perfecto, ya estamos. Cuando me digáis, sí o cuando me digáis. Eh, just, just a second. Ok, eh, when, when you wish. Okay, buenas tardes. Uh, good afternoon from Madrid. Good morning, Professor Eric Masur. Thank you so much for being with us virtually. We are very lucky to have you on board. An, an event that we have planned to celebrate within the framework of the breakfast of Innova Forum with the sponsor of ASISA, one of the most important supporters of our university. Let me first, for the reason, to thank his president, Francisco Iborra, for his contribution in this innovative initiative. Thank you very much, Francisco. We have managed to be together in one of the most exciting and perhaps far-reaching transformation as far as higher education is concerned. We hope that next time, Eric, you will have the opportunity to meet in person in Madrid, because although during the last 80 days, we have completely replaced our face-to-face -face traditional model in favor of online work, it will always be a pressure to enjoy the presence of Professor Masur and taking a tour with, with him around our campus. My most sincere gratitude as well to those who are with us today. Some of them have been able to attend your lecture through the YAP courses, uh, including our regional minister of university design and innovation of the community of Madrid. Good afternoon, Eduardo. Thank you very much for being with us for your unwavering support in these matters. This is especially so at this time where we are endeavoring to build up the virtual teaching and evaluation model of the University of Madrid. Eric Masur is the Balkansky Professor of Physics and Applied Physics and Area Chair of Applied Physics at Harvard University, member of the Faculty of Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and past president of the Optical Society. Professor Masur is a prominent physicist known for his contribution in nanophotonics, an international recognized educational innovator and a sought after speaker. In education, he is widely known for his work on peer instruction and interactive teaching methods aimed at engaging students in the classroom and beyond. In 2014, Masur became the inaugural recipient of the Minerva Prize for Advancement, advancement of, in Higher Education. He has received many awards for his work in physics and in education and has founded several successful companies. Professor Masur has widely published in peer review journals and holds numerous patents. He has also written extensively on education and is the author of Peer Instruction a user manual published in 1997, a book that explains how to teach large lecture classes interactively and of the principle and practice of physics, published in 2015, a book that presents a groundbreaking breaking new approach to teaching introductory calculus-based physics. Professor Masuk is a leading speaker on optics and on education. His motivational lecture on interactive teaching, educational technology, and assessment have inspired people around the world to change their approach to teaching. This is only a very brief presentation of the peer instruction professor that is going to share with us the way of getting every student ready for every class, a very inspired title. Let me now present and thank Sorin Kostri with the Rector of the University Network and Public Relations of Bucharest University and a steering committee member of Civis University. Thank you very much, Sorin, for accepting to be moderator of our conference supported by Civis, our European Civic University formed by the Alliance of Eight Leading Research Higher Education Institutions, Acres Europe, with a strong civic identity. 
a global initiative with strong roots to local territories, regions, and communities, turning toward the Mediterranean and African regions and nurturing a new ambition European higher education initiative. CIVIS members are committed to work together in order to address the 21th century challenges. We are an impact-driven alliance that fosters genuine innovation and social transformation. We are so proud to share with all of our members your conference. Thank you very much. Very, thank you very much, Sain. Thank you very much to everybody. Hello, everybody. I think now we will have a few words right from uh, Mr. Eduardo Sicilia, Regional Minister of Science, Universities and Innovation, Comunidad de Madrid. Good afternoon, Madrid. Good morning in Boston. And many thanks to Autonoma University and especially to its rector, Professor Rafael Garese. It's a great privilege to be part of uh, this exciting event and to be able to share this virtual space with the universities of tomorrow. The CIVIS Alliance is driving innovation and excellence and the Autonomous University is part of this revolution. And a special thanks to the Academy for this effort to safeguard university life despite COVID. This session of the International Academic Program is a perfect example of your commitment to students and to society. We are not the same people that we were four months ago. Neither the society, institution, are, or companies are. We have all learned a lot during these uncertain times. At the beginning of the lockdown, universities managed to adapt all their programs from traditional in-person teaching to remote classes in just 48 hours. This process requires an immense effort from both professors and students. Even harder was to define fair evaluation model where the students learning progress was collected. We now have the opportunity and challenge to reconsider our own university education model. We will be able to define what content is suitable to digital environments of market class and which dynamics can only be done face to face, where the key always lays on the interaction between students and on the source of the collective intelligence. Professors must extract knowledge, not impart knowledge. Some time ago, I had the honor of attending Professor Masur classes at Harvard, and I know he always says that learning must be a social experience for reaching in a virtual setting. I understood early on that technology is but an instrument for reaching more people in a more effective way. He knew that he would need further engagement and interactive strategies in an online education. And I believe that we need to pursue a new model with a new interaction dynamics between professor and students. The pandemic has precipitated a learning revolution that should have taken place years ago. And Madrid is committed to lead this way toward these changes. The government of Madrid is determined to work on a legal framework to promote growth and innovation via the creation of the learning society. The university must be a role model to society. It must lead the transformation that we need. Having knowledge is not enough. The university needs to innovate in what it does and how it does it. If we take this big step towards transformation university, we will transform society. Let's take on the challenge, not because of coronavirus, but because we have a great opportunity to do it now. The crisis has taught as what we are able to achieve through our will, culture, strategy, and responsibility. I am certain that university, what welcomes us today, we will lead in this process. 
I look forward to listening Professor Massar, who will inspire us. Thanks, many thanks. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Eduardo Sicilia. Thank you, Rector Rafael Garese, for your very kind words. And now, uh, hello again, everybody. Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. And now it's my honor and pleasure to introduce you Professor Eric Mazur, who is well known around the world for both physics and the metaphysics of teaching, teaching by questioning. So Eric, you have the floor in order to let us know how to get every student ready for every class. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rector Garres and Councillor Cecilia and Vice Rector Coste. It's uh, great to have this opportunity to, uh, to speak to you. It, not in the way that we had intended. The, the original plan was to have me come to you in Madrid, and I was very much looking forward to my trip. Who could have predicted just a few months ago how much the world has changed? Councillor Cecilia said something really interesting. He said that learning deep down is a social experience, and here we are, all isolated, socially isolated, cut off from each other, only connecting uh, electronically online. And, and I think I'd like to get back to that, um, that idea uh, in a moment as we, uh, as we go through this event here. I wanna start by reflecting for a moment on when I started teaching at Harvard. Feels like yesterday, it's already, um, 36 years ago, I cannot believe how, uh, how time flies. When I started teaching, I never asked myself, how am I going to teach? Which is you know, kind of strange, right? Because when you start to do something new in your life, that should be the first question you ask yourself. Question did not even come up in my mind. It was perfectly clear what I was going to do in my classroom. I was going to do to my students what my professors had done to me, to lecture, as you can see on, uh, on this uh, very old picture of me teaching um, in the screen in front of you or, or just below there. Now, why did I do that? I did that because in a sense, I was projecting my own experiences onto the world around us. I think we all tend to do that, right? I, when I was a student, I had learned physics from my professors by sitting in a classroom like that, an auditorium, listening to them lecture. And I'm sure that when they started lecturing, they made exactly the same assumption. They had learned it in an auditorium from their professors, and therefore they started lecturing when they became a professor. And so forth, generation after generation, after generation, after generation, all the way to this person here. This is actually an illustration from an illuminated manuscript from the 14th century, showing um, a king of Germany, emperor of the Holy Roman Emperor, giving a guest lecture at the University of Bologna. And look at the similarity between this illustration, which was, this was an event that probably took place in the 11th or 12th century, and a picture of me lecturing early in my career. It's not very different. You can see here how people in the front row are carefully paying attention and looking at the lecturer or at their notes. The people in the second row look a little bit less engaged. You can see, a picture here who look of two people who are looking rather bored. And in the back row, they're not even paying attention. They're chatting with each other. And then there's this person here in the front row. I don't know if he or she is just cringing in agony or, or fell asleep. It shows a scene that is very familiar to all of us in higher education. And it also shows how little education has evolved over the course of hundreds of years. Back to the 20th century when I started teaching. 
And you can see that this is a really, really, really old picture. It was taken BC. No, not before Christ. I'm not that old. It was taken before computers. You can see I'm using a, an overhead uh, projector there. Now, something really interesting happened. Um, as I told you, I started lecturing this way. I was asked to teach as an assistant professor a course that nobody in my department wanted to teach, physics for pre-medical students. You know, these were not students who wanted to learn physics. No, they already hated physics before getting into my classroom. So they thought, you know, since these students who don't like taking physics give poor evaluations to us, let's ask the new assistant professor to teach that course. And something really interesting happened. What happened was that the students actually liked my lectures. They gave me really high evaluations. Most of my colleagues would get low evaluations for the physics for pre-medical student course. I got high evaluations. And on top of that, they did well on what I thought were difficult exams. So very quickly, I started to believe that I was the world's best physics teacher. It turned out <laughs> that it was not quite uh, a realistic idea, but it was very pleasant. Uh, and for many, many years, I went on lecturing like this, thinking <clears throat> that I was more successful at, as a teacher than most of my colleagues at Harvard University. Now, it turned on, it turned out that this was a complete illusion, a house of cards, which later I found out was not true at all. Yes, my students liked my lecture, and yes, they could do well on my exams. But if I asked them very simple conceptual questions, that asked them to transfer what they'd learned from the situation which they'd learned into a situation they had not seen before, they were unable to answer the question. So rather than giving you all the detail, which you can see in my lectures on YouTube, I thought I was gonna do with you a little demo. I wanna do you a little demo. I'm gonna give you a little uh, lecture just to show you how ineffective the lecture is, and also to show you something that suggests a much better approach to teaching. Now, my little lecture will be very short and it will be aimed at a general audience like you. It will be dealing with thermal expansion. Thermal expansion deals with the fact that hard solids like, like stone or metal or wood expand when they get hotter and they contract again when they get colder. This is very important in engineering, in medicine, in many different uh, areas. And you may think, well, it doesn't affect me. Yes, it affects you as well. If you've ever been in a train at low speed as it approaches the station, you may have heard this clickety-clack sound of the wheels as the train goes from one section of the rail to another. The reason that you hear this clickety-clack sound is that the sections of the rails are not touching each other. There's a little gap that is left in between them. And when the wheel goes over that gap, it makes this clickety-clack sound. The reason they put the rails down with a little opening is so that when it gets hotter and the metal expands, there's space for that expansion to take place. If you just put the rails together, bad things happen, like you can see on that picture, and the rail will buckle and the train will derail. Likewise, when you build tall buildings, skyscrapers with metal structures, you have to take into account the expansion of the metal, which is more pronounced than the expansion of other materials. You may think, well, this doesn't affect me. It does affect you. Next time that you're at your dentist, remember my little lecture and think about this. If your dentist were to fill a cavity in one of your teeth and just put an ordinary metal in it, the next time you would drink a cup of coffee or tea, you would have a big problem because the metal would expand. And since the metal expands more than the material of a tooth, you 
tooth would crack into two. So the dentist actually has to use a material that has an expansion that matches the expansion of your tooth. Now, you may wonder why is it that materials and all, all hard materials, I'm not talking about soft materials like skin or, or dough or anything. No, I'm talking about hard materials like, like metal or ice or, or stone or wood. They all expand. The reason that they expand is that atoms in a solid hold each other firmly in place. And I'm showing nine atoms here on the screen in front of you. And as the material gets hotter, the atoms get further away from each other. So this is cold and this is hot. Cold and hot. That's all you need to know for this little lecture. And you have to, I, I forgot to tell you, <laughs> I'm going to give you a little test after this lecture in order to see how effective my lecture was. So you better pay attention, right? So this is cold. And this is hot. And it's not just the nine atoms that we're showing here. It's all the millions or billions of atoms that make up a solid. So cold and hot. You may wonder, why is it that the atoms get further away from each other when it gets hotter? Well, look at my video for a moment. The reason is that atoms don't sit still, they vibrate. And the amplitude of that vibration is related to what we call temperature. So if the amplitude is low, the metal is cold. If the amplitude is high, the, amp the, the temperature is hot. So cold like this, hot like that. Now imagine you're an atom. You wouldn't just sit like this. You shake back and forth. And as it gets hotter, you shake more and you push the atoms around you away because you need more space. That's a rather simple model of what happens in reality. But it's a pretty accurate reflection of what happens at the atomic scale. So, cold and hot. Does anybody have any question? If you have a question about what I've just presented to you, please put it in the chat. I'll pause just a minute. And think about this. I'm not, I'm not going to simply ask you you know, make the screen black and ask you when atoms get hold, get when when um, ma materials get hotter, the atoms get further away from each other, closer together, or the same. That would be simply me transferring information to you, and you transferring that same information back to me. I'm going to ask you if you can take this image of atoms going further away from each other and apply that to a new context. So you better ask me questions. Look, Jose Vicuña is saying all clear. I love that. I love it when my lectures are clear. Ah, Carmela is asking me an interesting question. Why does the one in the middle not move? You see, it's not moving. I'm gonna give you an answer and you're not going to like, I like Adrian's suggestion there. Uh, um, I'm going to give Carmela an answer to Carmela's question, which you might not like, Carmela, but it is the truth. The reason the one in the middle is not moving is because to prepare this slide, I made two drawings in Adobe Illustrator, which is the program I use to make my, my drawings. I made this drawing of the atoms close together, and then I make the other drawing, the, the second one here was the atoms further away. And then I put the two on top of each other with the central atom of the top layer on top of the central atom of the bottom layer. That's why the central atom is not moving. Now, <laughs> you may be laughing about that, but it's actually true. It was a choice I made when I put those two layers on top of each other. I could equally well have taken this black atom and put it on top of that gray atom. In that case, this atom would not have remained still. This one would not have moved. And this one would have moved away and towards the left. And that one would have moved, instead of moving up, would have moved towards the right. I said to the, to the bottom and the left, I meant to the bottom and the right here, of course. But here's the interesting point. And this is why, um, why Carmela's question is actually such a great question. 
the end result is the same. All the atoms are further away from each other. And remember, in a, in a real metal, there are not nine atoms, there are not nine million atoms, there are not nine billion atoms, there are not nine billion billion atoms. No, there are billions of billions of billions of atoms. So the actual fact which position, which the exact position of one atom is and which one atom does not move doesn't matter. The key point is all of them move away from each other. There is no central atom. Okay, well, since uh, Jose said that it all was clear, I am going to assume that you are ready for my test. So thank you, Carmela. I'm going to hide my chat right now because I cannot read the chat and talk at the same time. So in order to take the test, and remember, it's not just the nine atoms, it's all nine millions of them. I would like you to pull up a browser. So go to your browser on your laptop or your tablet or your smartphone, and then go to this URL there, bit.ly slash UAM test, and then enter some info. It doesn't matter whether it's accurate or not. Just, just type in anything, but you have to fill out those three fields. And then join the session ID that is listed there. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to join. I see already I have a few people joined. That's great. Once I have a, a quorum of people who have joined, I will go ahead. And if you have a question about getting on, let me know. I only have three people join. I need more people. Five. Good. So follow the instructions on the screen. Enter the information as requested and then join session ID 4079671040. 4079671010. Good. I see a lot of people are getting on right now. Fantastic. Okay, so here is the question I want you to answer. And the information is at the bottom in case you haven't gotten on yet. You can follow the instructions at the bottom. Consider a rectangular metal plate. It's illustrated there in the top corner. But the plate has a circular hole in it. Now imagine that we uniformly <clears throat> heat this plate <clears throat> so that the metal starts to expand. What happens to the diameter of the hole? Will the diameter of the hole increase? Will it stay the same or will it decrease? So take a moment to think about that and then please enter your um, choice on that platform. Okay, sorry, I haven't delivered the question yet here. I'm going to do that now. Oops, this is the wrong one. Maybe I did enter the question. Let's see. Okay, let me deliver it. So now you can answer the question online. And if you've already answered, so the same question that you see um, on my slide should be in your browser window. And please select one of the three choices. Don't answer it in the chat. The ID should still be at the bottom of the for some reason, I see no answers. Maybe I should just refresh my browser. Let's see. Oh, yes, people have answered. Fantastic, good. Okay, so if you've already answered, then um, ask yourself, what is exactly the reason? How would I explain my reasoning to somebody else? If you haven't answered yet, I urge you to make up your mind. I'm gonna give you only a few more seconds to answer because what we're gonna do, first of all, I see that, you know, 
only some of you got it right and many, many, many of you got this answer incorrect. So what I'm going to do, which makes one thing very clear, you may have thought that my lecture was very clear about expansion, but it's still not possible for you to answer a simple question about expansion correctly. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you to breakout rooms and you'll be with about four to five people in breakout rooms. I would like you to check within with each other to see what answer you gave. And then if you have two people with opposing answers to tell what the reasons are for giving that answer. So there you go. I'm going to send you into the breakout rooms. I'll leave you there about three minutes. And then I want you to re-answer the question. So there we go. So please join the um, breakout room and I'll call you back after about three minutes. So if you're still here in the main room, you should have a button at the bottom that says breakout room. Click on it, you'll see your assignment and please join your breakout room. I'm gonna go into breakout room too. So you'll be alone here if you don't join the room. So I see that there are still some people here in the main room and not in the breakout room. You should have a button at the bottom. Uh, Jose, I'm gonna assign you to a breakout room and choose Ilan. I'm gonna put you in a breakout room too. And the others, you should have a button at the bottom of your screen that says breakout room, click on it. If you're calling in through a phone, Unfortunately, you won't be able to join a breakout room. I was just in a breakout room. They were actively discussing. I'm gonna to go to another breakout room shortly.
test. Why am I muted? No, I'm muted. Good. So I was in uh, in several rooms. Uh, I was in one room where everybody had the same answer. That was uh, quite unusual. And in some other rooms where people were were all fired up and actively engaged in thinking about the whole. Now, I'm sure that by now, most of you have forgotten. I'm not here to talk about thermal expansion. The, the answer to this question really doesn't even matter. What I wanted to show is that if you teach by questioning rather than by telling, it's much more engaging to the mind than if you're just listening uh, to somebody. In fact, it's, it's just absolutely amazing how easy it is to reawaken the curiosity of the human mind. I mean, anybody who's looked at, at small children like you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years old. They don't stop asking why. We are all born learners. We are all born scientists. We're wired to want to explain the world around us, which is why we, when we're small, we don't stop asking our parents, our teachers, why, why, why. We don't accept things on authority. It's a sad fact that education beats this out of us in a sense that, and out of our students, right? By the time we get our students in the classroom, it's no longer about the why, it's about give me the answer so I can pass the test. Now, the great thing is I've just demonstrated to you how easy, and in a classroom, this would work even better because you can have students seek out the neighbors around them who have a different answer, which is a little bit harder online, although it's possible, but I didn't have time to set that up. I've shown how easy it is to reawaken that innate curiosity of uh, the human mind. Now, before I tell you the answer to this question, because I'm sure you're dying to know what the answer is, um, let's analyze what happened here. Uh, I asked you a question, you thought about the question, and then I had you make a commitment by voting. In the classroom, initially what I did is I had students put their hands on their chest, showing it with fingers, no technology needed whatsoever. Then we developed this platform, which also permits students who have different answers to find each other more easily. So you made a commitment. And then after you made the commitment, I put you in a breakout room in the classroom, I just have told you, turn to the person next to you. And you had to externalize your answer. You had to say, I chose, hmm, what did you choose? And then in the discussion, and I found that by visiting a couple of the breakout rooms, it was no longer about the answer. It was a reason that lead to the answer. How do you get to the answer that you uh, gave? But most importantly, you became emotionally invested in the learning process. If I were not to tell you what I think the right answer is, you'd, you know, you'd come running after me and ask me in the chat, hey, what's the answer to this question? Now, before I can tell you the answer, I want you to vote a second time to indicate what you now believe to be the right answer. So please go back to your browser and indicate what you now believe to be the right answer. I'm gonna give you one minute uh, to do that. So go back to the browser, should, you should still be logged in. The only thing you have to do is select the answer again. Okay, I have 19 responses in, I need some more. So, and I still have 155 people online. Okay, so, hmm, you know, I'd hope that you would do a little bit better. Um, and I, I, you know, the first response to my lecture was all clear. Remember, you saw it in the chat, all clear. And if I had not insisted on you asking me a question, I would have believed that my lecture was clear. You would have believed that my lecture was clear. But if I look at the responses in front of me, 
I'll actually show them to you in the browser. I'm going to stop delivery and I'm going to show it to them, uh, revealing what the right answer is. Well, no, let, let's let's first go through this with the right answer. What is the right answer? The right answer is number one. It in Increases, And as you can see in the platform, I'm going to show you the answers. It improved a little bit after the discussion, but only 30%, three in every 10 participants got the right answer the initial, um, the initial time. Now you may wonder why is that, and I, I don't want you to stay awake. And you're, again, my, 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 my talk here really is about how do you best get students ready for class and in class? And, and not about thermal expansion, but I don't want you to be in bed tonight at midnight or 2 a.m. wide awake still thinking about this hole. So imagine this, imagine in the refrigerator, I'm gonna to try to explain this in, in some terms that I heard when I was in a breaking, breakout room. Imagine you have a jar of jam in the refrigerator. It's a glass jar with a metal lid take it out because you want to put some jam on your toast and you hold the jar and the lid and you can't open it. What do you do? You put the lid under hot water. The lid is a ring and a plate and the ring gets bigger as it expands under hot water and you can open it. You all knew that. Well, maybe you say, well, <laughs> you didn't ask about a, a jar. You asked about a metal plate with a hole in it, not about a ring. Okay. Imagine we have a hole like this, like it's a piece of paper, but sorry, a, a plate without a hole in it. And I'm using this piece of paper to represent the metal. Now we take a pen and we draw a circle on this piece of paper, on this metal plate. So we have a metal plate with a circular, with a circle on it, not a circular hole. Now we put this plate in the oven and we turn up the temperature and the plate expands. What happens to the diameter of the circle? It gets bigger, everything gets bigger, the plate gets bigger, so the circle will get bigger too. You say that's unfair. If there was a hole, then the metal would expand into the hole. Let me show you what's wrong with that line of reasoning. Imagine that we all go outside together in a time that you don't have to social distance anymore. And we hold hands and we form a large circle. And each of us is an atom at the edge of the hole. I, I show a drawing for each dot is represents one of us. And each dot is also one atom. Now expand, imagine that I count to three, one, two, three. And at the count of three, we each step in towards the center. Can you imagine that? So we hold hands and we each step in towards the center of the circle. What just happened to the distance between us? It got smaller. And it can't get smaller because it gets hotter. We're all shaking more. We need more space. So what's a way to make more space for us? Well, one is to remove a few atoms, but atoms don't disappear like that. Or the other is to make the hole larger. They have to make the, the hole has to get larger in order to make more space for the atoms to vibrate as it gets hotter. You won't forget that. So I wanna point out two things before I wrap up this. Um, this talk here. One is my clear lecture wasn't very good at inducing any learning. It was good at transferring information, but it was not good at transferring learning. And the discussion, even though it was limited by the fact that only three out of 10 people had the right answer, it did improve the performance somewhat. It, it permitted some people only a few percent, unfortunately, because there were so few people to start out that got the aha moments. So that actually suggests something interesting. The reason that the lecture didn't work that well was that my lecture was really focused on information transfer and education is much more than information transfer. I like to see education as a two-step process. One, information transfer, it's important, but it's not sufficient. The second part is sense-making. 
having the aha moment. Oh, now I get it. Now ask yourself, where in the standard approach to teaching, where do these two steps take place? The information transfer takes place in class, usually in the form of a lecture. The out of uh, the, the sense making, the aha moments, typically takes place out of class. And if you ask yourself, which of these two steps is the hardest? I think we all agree. It's the second step. It's the sense making part that's the difficult. The information transfers. We live in information age. There's so many different ways to do the information. Uh, transfer. So after discovering what we just went through and noticing that students teaching each other was so much more effective, why? Because imagine you have two students, student A and student B next to each other, Jose and Maria, let's say. Jose does not have the right answer because he doesn't understand it. Maria has the right answer because she does understand it. On average, Maria is more likely to convince Jose than Jose is able to convince Maria because she has only recently learned it. She still knows the difficulties that the beginning learner has. Whereas Professor Mazur in front of the class learned it such a long time ago. To him, it's so clear that he cannot even understand why Jose doesn't get it. That's why this method of having students discuss material with each other in class works so extremely well. So when I discovered that, I decided to essentially flip this process around, to have the information transfer outside of the class and to have the sense making in class in the form of what I call peer instruction, instruction entre pares. And essentially, I teach through questioning I have students think about the question, just I had you think about the question briefly. I poll them either by having hands on the chest indicating all at the same time what the answer is or through one of the platform. Then I tell them to find somebody who has a different answer and try to convince that person. I poll them again. And then I have an explanation which can either come from one of the students or from myself. And that cycle essentially repeats until time is up. And the aha moments actually take place during this discussion. You will actually see students experience that aha moment in front of you. They'll go, oh, yes. And once you have that aha moment, you know it forever. You know it for life. That's the beauty of it. So I, I don't have time to go into any details because I have a little bit more to tell you. but. Peer instruction, if you go to Google Scholar right now and you type in peer instruction and veterinary medicine or English or Spanish or, or art history or physics or chemistry, you'll find people who have done research showing significantly higher learning gains. In my own case, I saw that with lecturing, I had about a 25% normalized gain from beginning of semester to the end of the semester. After I went to peer instruction, I tripled that gain, and that's not unusual. In addition, a study done at Carnegie Mellon shows that if you have this active form of learning, you have much better retention, because once you have this aha moment, as I said a moment ago, it sticks. You remember it not just to pass the exam, you remember it for life. So in the last few minutes, I want to briefly tell you about the other part, the information transfer. Since we've eliminated the lecture, that you have to make time for these questions. You can try to do both in class, but then you won't have enough time for the information transfer at all. So the question is, how can you effectively transfer information outside of the classroom? Since I had already recorded the video of all of my lectures, I thought, you know, maybe I'll just have students watch the video. But there's a problem with video. The first thing is that the transfer pace is set by the video, which is to say the learner has to essentially process the information at the pace that is set by the instructor. And in fact, which means there's not really time to think, right? Because imagine that you're listening to a lecturer and there's something that makes you think 
and you want to think, your mind wanders, you can no longer process the incoming information. With video, you could pause it, but the data that I've seen from edX and a couple of other platforms shows that most students accelerate the video. They watch it at 1.5 or 2 or 2.5. The other thing is the viewer is passive. And the data from edX also show that over time, the students watch less and less because they discover that they can answer the multiple choice questions by simply Googling them online without even watching the video. And most of all, it's an isolated individual of stu experience, the video and the students. So essentially by asking students to watch video, we're moving this out of the classroom and we're not really accomplishing the information transfer that we want to accomplish. So that's when I thought we should really have students go back to reading. Reading is such an important skill. It's a skill on which we depend after we graduate in our professional lives. And therefore, we should really train the students to learn by reading. It has a huge advantage because when you read material, you are in control of the transfer pace. If your mind starts wandering, you automatically stop reading and you read as fast or as slow as you want, not as the instructor lectures. And also research has shown that the, act, the brain is much more active when reading than when uh, listening. But there's a problem with reading too, namely it's an isolated individual experience and there's no real accountability. How do I know if I tell my students read chapter 25 that they indeed do read chapter 25 before they come uh, to the classroom? What is it that we want? We really want every student prepared for every classroom so that they can be taught by questioning in the classroom. And ideally without having to grade quizzes or, or do any extra work. It is only recently, a few years ago that I finally realized what the solution was. I'd worked hard on making the classroom a more social interactions through peer instruction. The key was to make the reading and the out of class component also a social interaction. And without knowing, I prepared myself actually for the pandemic that happened this year. I'll come back to that in just a second. So essentially, what is it that we want? We want every student prepared for every class without doing extra work. That prompted me to design a platform called Perusal, which is entirely free. You can use it in your class next semester if you want. At its heart, Perusal is a social learning platform. Students can log in through their social network, Facebook, Twitter, Google. And once you're on, it looks like an e-reader with one twist. The e-reader shows you who else is online. So in a big class, you'll actually see many avatars of students who are online. And if while you're reading, there's something that you don't understand, you can highlight the text and the act of highlighting the text opens a chat window. And after you type in some text, the highlight will stick. So after a while, the text will be marked up and if you click on one of these markups, it opens a chat window. Let me magnify this a little bit for you. Here, a student whose avatar is shown here. And in the actual program, if I would click on it, I would see the name of the student. On October 20th at midnight, she said, I don't understand how this combination of factors tells you anything about blah, 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 blah. A little later, about half an hour later, another student with the initials SP write, I think you may be able to think about the direction separately, blah, 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 blah. Two days later, a third student on October 22nd, as you can see, says, this is a great question. To further elaborate on this, we can blah, 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 blah. So in a sense, you see some sort of asynchronous peer instruction going on online. There's much more, but I don't have time to show you. There are things to vote up good questions so they bubble up to the top. There are features to chat individually without chatting about something specific in the text. There are ways of upvoting good answers so that good explanations bubble up. There are ways to use email to interact with the chat. Unfortunately, I cannot really show you all of these features. But 
what I do want to discuss briefly is who, how do you get students to participate in this um, process? And essentially, the platform uses a combination of two types of motivators. One, intrinsic, I want to participate, and the other, extrinsic. Let's start with the extrinsic one. There's a rubric-based assessment of the student's interaction with the text. Essentially, the students must demonstrate thoughtful reading and interpretation of the text. Uh, what does that mean? It means that if you just highlight something and say, I don't understand this, it's not enough because you can do that without, without reading or without thinking. You could just go in and highlight and say, I don't understand this. If you highlight something and you say, I don't understand this because on page 256, it says blah, 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 blah. At least we know it's connected to something else in the text. If you highlight something, you say, I don't understand this because on page 256, it says blah, 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 blah. And I thought that, and you reveal your thinking, you start to get full credit. We want a certain minimum quantity of annotations that are thoughtful. We want them to be on time before class, and we want them to be distributed through the text. So if it's a five page assignment, we want students not only to annotate the first page, but also the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth page. With that very simple rubric in my class, which has 60, 75 students, I get over 20,000 annotations in one semester. 20,000. you process all of it automated. We use a machine learning uh, algorithm, a specialized machine learning algorithm that actually assesses intellectual content. Uh, I don't have enough time to really go into the details, but you can find on the perusal website some papers that point out the, um, the, uh, the way this works and some research that has been done on it. It actually does better than as an, an individual human does. So in other words, if you train it with a specific person's grading, it will follow that training better than another human because <clears throat> some of this interpretation is of course rather subjective. It's not completely objective, the, the, <clears throat> the intellectual content. Immediately afterward, there's a great book which interfaces with the learning management system. So you can exactly see what each student has done and get detail on how thoughtful the annotations were, how many were on time and so on. I, I, I cannot really give you uh, too much detail in the little few minutes that I have left. I wanna show you one more feature because it gets even better. You see in a sense, the annotations are a window in And it was a book for my student. And I was just clicking on their, on their annotations and reading their feedback. I went, oh, wow, that's how they're thinking. And I realized that my students often attach different meanings to words than I did because they didn't have the expert vocabulary that I had. And I think I was able to actually improve my writing significantly by looking at it. Also, it pointed out to me what to address in the classroom. I'd go, wow, this would be the perfect question to ask in class. It connects, in a sense, the pre-class reading and the in-class uh, activity. So we developed another algorithm in perusal that we call the confusion report. So rather than you having to from a, not my class, but from a class at the University of Central Florida, a physics class too. And for this chapter 24 that the students had to read, it shows the three main topics of confusion, right-hand rule, direct, direction of the magnetic field, Earth's magnetic field. So I can walk into the classroom and I said, thank you for your annotations. I, I looked at your annotations and it looks like there are three topics of confusion, the right-hand rule, the direction of the magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field. One of you asked the following question. 
Why is it that the magnetic field points away, blah, blah, blah. I actually quote the question from an actual student and they'll go, wow, he read all our questions. <laughs> well, I read only nine of them because it shows three exemplar questions for each topic of confusion. But it certainly gives the impression that I am actually taking their annotations uh, seriously. And rather than asking questions on subject that I think they find difficult, I can actually zoom in on what is difficult uh, for them. So what are the motivating factors? Well, one, it's a social interaction online. It's fun to be interacting with each other online for the students. Some spend a significant amount of time on there rather than on Facebook. Um, secondly, there's a tie into an in class activity. It, rather than they find out that if they express their misunderstanding, there's a good chance that I will actually address it in the classroom. And lastly, there's the assessment, assessment which is fully uh, automated. So let me show you some class test results. This shows you the number of chapters that the students missed annotating before coming for class. In my course, where they had to reach 17 chapters. So this plot really goes on towards the, 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 the right, but you don't see it because there are no data, it's all zero. And these are three different semesters as we were improving the algorithm. Notice that in the last year that we did the testing, which was a couple of years ago, 70% of the students missed zero chapter Every single of the 70 chapters, they annotated thoughtfully. And then 18% missed one chapter, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, something like 8% missed two chapters, a few percent, three chapters, and a very few, maybe 2%, four chapters, nobody missed five or six. So if you put the first three bins together, that's close to 95% which means 95% reads either all or a few of them miss one or two. I don't know about you, but I miss that line sometimes and students sometimes have an exam in another class or they get sick or whatever. I think this is as close as possible as we can get to every student prepared for every class. And frankly, since developing perusal, I have not looked back. I have completely stopped lecturing, which is why I'm so happy that I can lecture to you uh, right now here because I actually love lecturing. Now you can use it, the, the software is free and you can just upload a PDF file, articles, book manuscript, whatever you want. If you want to use a commercial textbook, we have arrangements with most publishers to make the book available either through the university library or through individual student purchases of commercial books as well and often at a price that's much better than that of uh, of the uh, library uh, price but again you can start using it right away with pdf files or web articles or 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 anything else again more details unfortunately on uh, online because i don't have time to it so in conclusion, I've now showed to you how I do the out of class information transfer using perusal, and I'll use the in class sense making peer instruction. And what we have sort of proved together here right now today is that this works online. Perusal works online because it is online, but the peer instruction can actually be done online on Zoom with breakout rooms. Now yeah, it's a little bit more clumsy than doing it in the classroom, but it works. I went into several different breakout rooms and people were talking about the hole in the plate. So I hope in conclusion that I've shown to you that education is not just about information transfer. It's not about getting students to do what we do, solve the type of problems that we do. We want our students to solve the problems that we don't know how to solve. I want my students to stand on my shoulders and solve the problems that I cannot solve. And in order to do so, what we really need to do is have this active engagement, this social interaction, both out of class as well as in class. And in a sense, I've shown you the two tools that permit you to do this, not only in a real life setting in the classroom, but also online. 
Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Eric, for this wonderful lecture. Um, for this, I would say, Socratic model for teaching uh, by questioning. You know, what's amazing, your model is already working because somebody uh, started questioning you, and namely, does this perusal work in Spanish? And another one appeared, <laughs> answered, saying yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> it's really wonderful. So now yeah. for everybody, please write down your uh, questioning in the chat room. And we will try to address, I mean, Professor Mazur will try to address most of uh, them. We have like half an hour for um, addressing these questions. Thank you. So we already have. So Eric, are you going to take them directly or I'm going to select? Yeah, yeah I, I, I missed the questions that were earlier. So, so I see Jeremy. Hola, Jeremy. I, I know Jeremy from Chile. Is there a solution to integrating the answer to the quizzes to the composition breakout rooms? That's a very good, um, that's a very good question, right? Is there, is there, so, so right now I put you, so, so, so what uh, Jeremy is referring to is the fact that, let's say you have two students next to each other, you know, and they both have the same answer. It increases, it increases. What are they going to talk about? There's not much to talk about. On the other hand, if there's one that says the whole is going to increase and the other says the whole is going to decrease, then they can try to, to argue. I put you in the breakout rooms in a completely random manner. And, and uh, I am unaware, Jeremy, of a way of putting people in a breakout room in a, in, a, in a controlled way, which is why I made the breakout room four to five people. My assumption was if it's four to five people, it's likely that there will be, that not everybody will agree. Statistically, that should have been okay with only 30% of the people giving the right uh, answer. So unfortunately, I do not have a, uh, a, a ready solution uh, for that so that the breakout room can be tailored to the answer that they're given. So Soren, while I talk, I can't, uh, feel free to, to filter the questions. Um, it's very difficult because we have like 20 to 30. Thank you, professor. It was wonderful, <laughs> you know, and this kind of things. <laughs> well, so, uh, but the, the, so, the model, again, it works because somebody else asked this question, how much uh, it costs this perusal? And another one say it's free. And you know, and it's a, a parallel debate about the whole thing. Okay. Um, so, so I see, yes. Yeah, so Gustavo was asking how I, how I perceive the impact of perusal on students in public or state universities. So the University of Central Florida, for example, is a state university. Uh, and, uh, and you know, we, we right now perusal, look, first of all, I developed perusal to help me. It was pretty selfish. I, I wasn't thinking of other universities at all. And, and then five years ago, when we discovered that, that it actually really freed me from having to lecture, I started sharing it with colleagues and, and they jumped on it. And then we decided, well, why don't we just make it available to, uh, to the whole world? And now a few years later, we have over 600,000 students who are using it around uh, the globe. So many universities, state universities, private universities, universities in Spain, universities in all over Europe, in Asia, uh, in, in South Africa, in, in Latin America. And, and the reason is it's free. It's free, but that still means that if you want to use a textbook, then, then the publisher somehow has to be compensated for uh, the cost of the textbook. So in the Netherlands, I know that uh, at the University of Groningen, they have an arrangement that they make the book available through the library in order you know, not to have any piracy of the intellectual property of a, of a, of a publisher. So, and that's a state university. So, so there are many different schemes 
that make that possible. And if you have your own material, then you can just upload it. If it's uh, if it's an article from the web or a web page or an open stacks textbook, I mean there are many free uh, textbooks which are actually in the catalog on on uh, on perusal, then you can just use that. I found a really interesting one for yes. You. Is there any solution integrating the answer to the quizzes to the composition of the breakout room so that to maximize the diversity of answers in each breakout room? And disclaimer, he said, Jeremy, I'm working on one based on ZT Razor on Zen Zoom. Well, I can't. I can't wait for Jeremy's solution because, as I uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, I'm unaware of any any good solution. And um, so, Jeremy, let me know when you when 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 you have that done. Because right now, the way as I as I said uh, a few minutes ago, the way I made sure that there was enough diversity was by making the group relatively large, four to five people. I saw another uh, interesting uh, question from Irene Martin um, saying some people find that when they read online, they remember less than reading on paper. That, that's actually a very, um, a very good point. Very good point. Um, I, I, I'm unaware of actual data, I think that the important part, the remembering does not come from the reading either on paper or online. <clears throat> I think the remembering comes from, from and if you, study, if, if you look at some of the work that people who study memory uh, have done, like Roddy Roedinger at the University, of, at the Washington University in St. Louis, is that people's memory get reinforced by something called retrieval practice, by answering questions. So it's actually using the information that reinforces the memory more than just a simple being exposed to, uh, to the information. So I think that just the act of reading, whether it's on paper or, um, or uh, on the screen is not enough to remember, you have to actually practice using that information. And one way of doing that is by answering questions. So I think it's very important to follow it up, whichever way you use, whether they read on paper or, uh, or online, to have uh, a series of, uh, of questions. Let's I see found, the chat. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I found uh three interesting questions, but there are many, but now uh, I would like to know how you foresee next coming academic year, whether this kind of approaches is going to really convert many of us and how you see the future of higher education. In fact, that comes from Carmela, our beloved Carmela. Well, Carmela, thank you for that uh, great question and you know, I wish I could predict the future as well as I can remember the past. Unfortunately, that's um, that's not true. But what's going to happen in the next coming academic year? I can tell you that <clears throat> at Harvard we're preparing ourselves <clears throat> for uh, teaching online, even if the students are able to come back to the the university. It's very unlikely that we'll put them in an auditorium or in a classroom together. So the teaching is going to be online no matter what. I think that's 99.9% .9 certain at this point, even though Harvard has not announced it. The Harvard Kennedy School <clears throat> has announced that it will teach completely online next semester. So they, they just announced it last Friday. Um, so, so I'm preparing myself for online teaching and online teaching, I don't even have that much choice, right? I mean, what I did to you is pretty much what I'll do with my, um, with my students. Although I go a little bit beyond peer instruction, I actually wrap my course around projects. So it's a project-based course. Um, how do I see the future of higher education in general? And, and how many people will get converted. So I, I, 
I developed peer instruction in 1991. So that's almost 30 years ago. In 2021, next fall, it will be 30 years ago. I didn't develop this approach of teaching, Instruction Entre Paris, because I wanted to make a name for myself or because I wanted other people to start teaching like that. No, I did it because I had a problem in my class. My students were not learning. And I thought maybe if I teach by questioning, um, they learn better. And then in the 90s, as I got better result, I wrote a book about peer instruction, which is published in many languages now. And um, as people started reading my book, they started to apply it first in the sciences. But now if you go to Google and you type in, quote, peer instruction, other quote, so that you keep the two words together, and any discipline, chemistry, veterinary medicine, art history, I'm just saying something, you'll find articles written about peer instruction in all those other disciplines. So clearly over the course of uh, almost 30 years, the method has spread. It went slowly at first and a little bit faster thereafter. Has everybody been converted? No, of course not. It takes time. And I think that's probably a good thing because I want people to adopt and adapt the method. I, I don't think it's a good idea to say you must change. People need to change when they think there's a need for change. I happen to have thought 30 years ago that there's a need for change. Maybe you, maybe I've convinced some of you, but I am sure that I won't have converted everybody. So if you ask me to predict the future of higher education, I think that, you know, for a long, long while, there will be still people who continue to lecturing. I think that the transition to online teaching, which happened in March, <clears throat> it happened for you, it happened for me, it happened for the people in China, will have made a lot of people realize that lecturing is not optimum. It's not optimum, <clears throat> and you may think maybe it's not as good online as it is in person, but I, I don't think that's the main reason. The main reason that most instructors don't find lecturing works as well online is because they don't have the feedback that they have in the, in the classroom. But on the receiving end, your end while I'm talking now, it's not that different from sitting in a classroom and listening to me but you've seen how ineffective it is. And I think some of us may have realized that's ineffective because what happens is that Zoom permits you to record. In fact, we're recording this lecture right now. So if you give a lecture and you record it, why would you have to give it again the next year? Why not just tape the recorded lecture? So I think people are realizing that the lecture is something that can be done asynchronously rather than synchronously. And therefore our time is freed up to do something more meaningful than just lecturing. So I think that this transition that we've had will further push people away from live synchronous lecturing towards doing activities that people that keep people more engaged, like for example, peer instruction. That's one, one example. Thank you for that excellent uh, question, uh, Carmela. But I think that we will, we will continue to have universities in the form that they are now for a long, long while. Yeah, we are one of the most conservative institutions in the world. So another two uh, technical questions. Does perusal work to teach math and can perusal be installed on a local server? What do you know, Eric, about that? So, so yes, I, I, I know of quite a few instructors who are using, um, who are using perusal in math instruction. Um, and no, you cannot install perusal on the local server, but you can link it through your LMS. So if you use Blackboard or, or Moodle or Canvas, or desire to learn or any of the other platforms, you can integrate, uh, you can integrate perusal into uh, that platform. So that, you know, for students, perusal is just inside the, uh, 
the learning management uh, system. So, and I see here another another interesting another interesting question from uh, Shar, Dr. Sharmili Yaktap, who asked, "What are different other possible ways to engage students in sense making in the class other than questioning in pairs and groups?" And I I think that that's a very good question. I mean, perusal, uh, sorry, peer instruction is just one form of active learning, but there are of course many other uh, form. One is to have students do things to work on a project uh work on a on, in a laboratory setting do field work outside or to have discussion groups uh and, and we all know that right if you have a if you have a really small course let's say you have six students you would probably not be lecturing you'd be having a, a discussion around the table you put the students around the table and and facilitate the discussion so so there are actually many ways to actively engage a student. I think that's the key phrase, active engagement, so that they use their minds rather than just their, their pens to take notes, right? Because that's what is happening in, in, in most lectures. The instructor is lecturing from his or her notes and the students are writing down the notes in their, in their notepads. I, I once heard somebody describe the lecture as a process whereby the lecture notes of the instructor get transferred to the notebooks of the students without passing through the brains of either. That's what we want to avoid. Another uh, good question I would say is, I wonder what do you do when breakout rooms have faults inside? Uh, example, Grazia, they become convinced of an implausible answer. That may be rare in physics, but surely not in the social sciences. Very good question. That that actually that actually happens even in in the sciences, right? I mean, let's say I'm sitting next to somebody else. That person has the right answer, but it's not completely sure. I have the wrong answer because I'm not thinking about it the right way. I say, well, the metal is expanding and therefore it will expand into the hole and make the diameter shorter. And I have a strong personality and she changes her mind. And now all of a sudden the two of us have the wrong answer, even though she initially had the right answer. That does happen, but it is a self-correcting, it's a self-correcting process because after I've convinced her of the wrong answer, we go back to the main room and the professor says, the right answer is one, the hole gets larger. And I go, oops. And she goes, I am never gonna listen to him again because he, 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 he talked me into the wrong answer. And the next, I, so my confidence will actually go down I would say I have to be more careful and her confidence will go up. So in a single cycle that can happen, but over many cycles, the situation moves into the right direction under the guidance of the instructor. So thank you for, for asking uh, that question. I think we have time for one or maybe two questions. One is, did you receive any resistance from the students or your colleagues when you first started using perusal or reading to replace the information transfer content delivery as compared to the more popular online video e-lectures option? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, um, you know, I, um, when, when, when I lectured, um, my students gave me very high ratings, but there were of course always some students who complained. For example, there were some students who complained that I was, I, I gave my students copies of my lecture notes. So, so I would prepare lectures to lecture from. And at the end of class, I would give them a copy of my lecture notes. And I had a couple of students at the end of the class who complained, Professor Mazur is lecturing from his lecture notes. So there, there's always students who complain. After I switched to peer instruction, my ratings did not change. I think that has more to do with personality than anything else. 
but there were of course still some students who were complaining you, you know what the complaint was then they were they were no longer complaining it was lecturing for my lecture notes because i didn't lecture anymore now they complained professor mazur is not teaching us anything we have to learn it all ourselves Really? <laughs> yes, I, I like the reaction from Riyab Khalifa there. <laughs> you know, and I, at first I thought, wow, come on. But then I thought, well, that's actually the way it is. I mean, I cannot learn it for my students. They have to do the hard work, the learning. The best I can do is to coach them in their learning. So I think you're always meet some resistance and have some people who are are opposed to whatever you're doing um, but ultimately I think you as an instructor have to cho has to choose what you think is best for your uh, students now it's a really interesting question for me Greg. can I take that as the last question uh, Sorian I see Miguel Morante has a really interesting question about high achieving students who would benefit more. And I, I find that question so interesting. It's a very good question. It's very perceptive. And I find that such an interesting question because when I started, I thought that it was, you know, the lower half of the class that benefited at the expense of the better student, right? Maria and Jose, Maria is teaching Jose. She's the good students. And Jose is the one who is benefiting from her. So I was thinking the opposite of what you were saying, namely that it was the bottom of the class, the lower achieving students who were benefiting from the higher achieving students by having them pulled up. And then I discovered in agreement with what you're saying, that a lot of the higher achieving students were some of the biggest proponents of the method. There was one who was being interviewed who said that he liked the method because it benefited his learning because he was not just at the receiving end, but also at the giving end. And I was thinking, what does he mean by saying that? And then all of a sudden I realized, of course, who is the person who learns the most in any classroom? It's the teacher, the person who teaches who learns the most in any classroom. Even if I teach a course many years, I always get new insights from teaching that course. So in a sense, the better students learn by being put in the position of the teacher. But at the same time, the, the, the lower achieving students benefit from being taught by the higher achieving students. So you can imagine sort of learning as a progressive scale. One, you don't know anything. Two, you know. Three, you're able to teach it to somebody else. We typically make that second transition. The better students make that second transition. The bottom half makes that bottom transition. That's why there is such a great gain in peer instruction, and again, you can find some or many articles online that show you uh, what I just told you was actual uh, actual data. So thank you for that absolutely excellent question, uh, Miguel. Uh, we thank you all, Professor Mazur, because you gave us such uh, inspiring ideas in teaching. And I think we are going to implement that in our universities and especially in the CVs network. And uh, thank you to Autonoma de Madrid for offering us such a wonderful moment, uh, you know, uh, with you. Uh, I think now it's time to uh, Rector Gareze to, to finish this wonderful lecture. Thank you again, Eric. Well, thank you. It was really wonderful. Thank you so much. Rafael. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sorin. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Masur. Has been, as uh, some people told you, a quite inspiring uh, session. Uh, I think it's very timely also because I firmly believe that we are in a turning point now in higher education, and not specifically specifically for pandemia, 
uh, because we are in the 2020. So we are in the 21st century. And I think the higher education has a lot of challenges uh, in front of us. And this session has been, has been very inspiring, fantastic, you know, in all the terms because we think a little uh, bit about many, many, many topics that, you know, we in the day to day, have difficult, uh, it's very difficult to find the right time to, to, to answer and to think about this question. So as Solin said, we will try to, to think and try to, with this inspiration, try to implement to some changes in our education. In this sense, making education, I would say, that uh, we have learned today. So thank you very much uh, also to the, to the Minister, Regional Minister of Education, of, for his continued support to, to Madrid universities, also to Raquel Galindo, the, our director of, uh, of the IAP program, and Francisco Iborra for his continued support too. And all of you for attending this uh, wonderful session. Have a nice day, all of you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Bye-bye and, and be well. Thank you.